Hey everybody, uh, my name is uh, Ujwal. I'm a principal SA for Healthcare and Life Sciences Machine Learning and I lead the uh, Solution Architecture Group for Healthcare and Life Sciences Machine Learning SAs. Uh, I'm going to be joined today by uh, uh, Vidya. Uh, Vidya is the Applied Science Manager for ML Solutions Lab. And we are here uh, to talk about uh, federated learning and specifically a case study of how federated learning can be applied to healthcare and life sciences uh, you know, use cases. Uh, we are going to touch upon a lot of different things, uh, starting from um, the introduction to federated learning and specifically privacy preserving machine learning. We are going to get into the details of how it works, uh, give you a quick introduction to the concept. We would then look at uh, the application of federated learning and how, uh, why is it so important to apply techniques like these in the healthcare and life sciences context. We look at a case study. Uh, in particular, we, are, we will uh, pick up a data set and try to run a prediction model uh, which is running locally on one instance but also in a federated fashion and compare the results. Uh, we will take you through the evaluation exercise of different frameworks uh, that we chose, uh, some data points to consider when you are choosing your own frameworks when you're designing such systems. And then finally, we are going to look at a setup and a demonstration of our experiments and discuss the results. Now, before I get started, I do want to acknowledge that this is an absolute team effort of multiple people coming together across the organization to make this happen. Um, this is a joint collaboration between the Solution Architecture team, the ML Solutions Lab, uh, the partner essays, uh, the service teams, all of them having this uh, common interest of federated learning. So I'm uh, really uh, humbled to kind of be here and, and represent the great work uh, that all of us have been doing. This is obviously all voluntary, so we've been working for the good part of uh, 21 and even uh, the beginning of this year uh, to to create these evaluation frameworks, uh, to understand what are different options available when it comes to federated learning, and then finally porting it all into AWS, which is a massive exercise. So really thankful uh, for this team effort, and we are really uh, excited to see where it goes from here. So let's uh, talk about federated learning and the concepts associated to it. So federated learning is uh, a technique that allows you to decentralize your model training. So why is this important? In scenarios when you're training with multiple organizations or uh, training a model where multiple parties are involved and it's difficult for each of those parties to share data openly, um, the only choice they have is to actually just train on their data sets. The problem is that in such an approach, the model doesn't uh, learn very efficiently because it's just being exposed to a very limited quantity of data. Using the federated learning approach, you would be able to mitigate that challenge. You would be able to have multiple parties train a common model without sharing um, you know, data among each other. And then the learnings from each of these models would be applied to a global model, which will then have the advantage of um, you know, being exposed to all of these different data sets uh, in a secure manner. So how does this work? The first step is to create like some sort of a global model. This is the model that um, you know, is associated to a, the problem that each of the clients are uh, trying to solve. Um, and it is uh, generally maintained in a local um, you know, place on a server uh, that has the job of orchestrating the entire federated learning setup. You start the, um, the global model and you distribute that global model to each of the different endpoints. Endpoints in this case could be considered as clients. So let's say you're training uh, a model that is, is involving two different institutions, each of those institutions would be considered as a client in this case. Each of those clients or endpoints incrementally train on the data that's local to them. So the model in this case is being exposed to the local data that is available uh, at the client level. This client can be running you know, in another uh, system altogether, but there is a way in which the clients would be able to share the details of the learnings. And this is done by uploading the trained models uh, from the endpoints or the clients to the local, uh, to the server that is actually um, you know, orchestrating all of this. The server then receives all of this uh, from different clients and goes through an ex exercise of aggregation. So what that means is in that aggregation step, you are, um, you know, uh, the server is actually uh, taking into account all the learnings that have happened individually 
uh, in each of those clients and is able to devise a way in which they create a new version uh, of the global model. The global model is uh, then again distributed and this process continues until you achieve a termination criteria. It might be the end of your training cycle, maybe denoted by the number of epochs you want to run it with, or it might be that necessary accuracy or uh, metric that you want to achieve. Now there is a concept in federated learning and the genesis of this is all around uh, the ability uh, to be able to preserve and, uh, the security uh, of the data. And, and especially in the case of healthcare and life sciences, it becomes really important. And that's where the concept of privacy preserving machine learning comes in. Uh, in the case of privacy preserving federated learning though, the concepts are uh, you know, extended in sense that it allows you to create some sort of a cryptographic version of your model weights. So why is this important? Because when you're training the, uh, the models on a local level, you have to share this model now to, with the server where uh, you know, the server can interpret maybe how the data looked like at the local level. Uh, in other cases, it might be a scenario where uh, you know, each of the local models that are being trained, when they are uh, shared back uh, as a global model, uh, the individual clients can then infer uh, what was available in the, in the model in terms of data that it was exposed to uh, from another client's uh, database. So these are like scenarios which you want to prevent. Um, so the way you actually do that is uh, by the use of differential privacy as well as secure aggregation. So when it comes to differential privacy, it's a technique that allows you to anonymize uh, different features of a training set so that you cannot trace back on what the actual features look like. It is uh, a technique of introducing noise uh, in your, on your training data, but of course there is a um, uh, downside you have to consider that the more noise you introduce, um, the more further away will, will the model results be from the actual uh, you know, benchmark that you want to achieve. The other uh, technique that you have to keep in mind is the technique of secure aggregation. So when you apply uh, differential privacy and cryptography to the local um, you know, nodes, when the models are aggregated, you have to aggregate them in such a way so it cannot be traced back to the individual client's data. Both of these concepts are uh, equally important and equally necessary for you to make sure that the, the essence of privacy preserving uh, federated learning is preserved and you're not exposing any sensitive information because that's the first requirement you started with. Um, while you're decentralizing and distributed training for a lot, uh, lot of practical reasons, the primary uh, uh, you know, reason for this is uh, maintaining anonymity and maintaining the ability to not share data across different clients and centralize it. So going back to the previous uh, set of steps, uh, you know, we are now sort of revisiting this in the context of uh, privacy preserving federated learning. And very similarly, the model uh, is, the global model is then distributed to individual clients. But in the case of uh, when, when you introduce privacy preserving pre federated learning, you are actually cryptographically protecting uh, the models uh, on the local node and then uploading that uh, to, the, to the server. And then at the server level, when you're aggregating, you're actually doing a secure aggregation protocol rather than just simple aggregation that can be traced back. So those are some um, minute but important points to keep in mind when you're um, you know, looking at privacy preserving federated learning. In terms of uh, the components of the federated learning system, uh, it operates in the context of a very similar client-server model. So the server is the one that is responsible for orchestrating different nodes or different clients uh, and managing the states of different clients, like whether it's training, whether it's up and running or not, uh, is it receiving the information that it's sending, maybe even pinging it regularly to, to make sure it's healthy. On the client side though, uh, the responsibilities are very local to how they would want to train. So the client has um, the, the ability to take instructions from the server. And then you, know, you can run this client anywhere, like as long as it has connectivity to the server and is able to exchange the information that it um, needs. So in, in, in terms of components, they look very, very similar. There is, of course, a message passing uh, protocol that is involved here because you know, that's how each of the states are being handled and even the models are being, model weights are being trained, uh, are shared. Uh, 
generally we use MQTT or gRPC um, as uh, the, the protocol for this and this is how uh, the, the client and the server maintain communication connection. On the client side, you have the local data set. So the local data set is where a simple client would be able to you know, train a model and then have a local version of that model. And then using the crypto, uh, cryptography libraries, you'll be able to upload that uh, in an encrypted fashion to the server. On the server side, you would have uh, the ability to track state and the orchestration protocol and then uh, your ability to take the encrypted model and then aggregate it and redistribute it to the client. So uh, in, in, in terms of components, they are very synonymous. Now, when we started this journey of reproducing this concept on AWS, there were many things that we had to take into account and that's why uh, it took us so much time um, you know, to, to experiment with and come up with the right thing uh, that we believed was the right option uh, when it came to running uh, federated learning on AWS. Uh, and this has been going on for a good part of uh, 2021. So the results that you're going to see today are um, most likely from the first experiments that we did, but it has evolved a lot since then. And we are really excited to see where this field goes so we can you know, update our metrics and, and our models uh, accordingly. But right now, uh, when we started off, our major challenge was the automation piece. As you would see in my colleagues Vidya's section later, uh, the infrastructure setup for, uh, for a federated learning um, you know, environment is extremely complex. Uh, it involves uh, VPC peering or connecting different uh, instances together so they can be, sh um, you know, they have the ability to communicate with each other. Uh, the, the problem of maintaining it as a pipeline is also very considerable. Uh, the reason for that is anytime you want to add a new client, or make any changes to your scripts or deployment setup, you don't want to like manually open it up and you know, make those changes. It's error prone, it's not something that's scalable. So how do you turn it into a deployment pipeline that can truly be used in a production workload? That became a huge challenge for us. The next thing that we had to put our, our wrap our heads around was uh, the ability to choose the right instance configuration. Like when we were looking at the diversity in the data sets that typically are involved in multi-party training, uh, we found that different instances would be required for different kinds of data sets. And to choose the right instance uh, for the server and each of the nodes uh, is a bit of a work which you'll have to figure out um, you know, on a case-by-case -case basis. The other thing is debugging. Because this is a decentralized model, if any of the nodes fail or if there is like a problem with the local data set, uh, at a node level, at a server level, you won't be exposed to that uh, information. So how do you debug um, you know, pipelines in, in cases where um, all the errors might be decentralized and no central way of uh, looking at it? And the next point is actually very related to the first point, which is logging. Because this is a decentralized uh, you know, setup, each of the logs are generated uh, at a client level and no way of actually centralizing it. So if there is an error, you, you won't be able to look at the central uh, server log and figure it out. Uh, so this again becomes an issue. And then finally, any metric that you want to evaluate, be it uh, on the infrastructure level as, as well as the model metrics. Um, no single model uh, is being exposed to the overall global metrics. So we'll have to take into account how you share uh, the data uh, or the model weights back, how is the model evaluated, how is the secure aggregation happening? Like each of these things go into the final model metric that you would want to evaluate. So these were some of the challenges which we have been grappling with as a team uh, for uh, close to a year now. And you know we have um, certain sort of provisions or, or solutions available that we have been able to actually uh, mitigate some of these challenges which we'll show you. So now let's switch gears and, and talk about the use of federated learning in healthcare. So one of the things that becomes really important when, when it comes to the use of machine learning in general in healthcare is the ability of generalizability. So what I mean by generaliz uh, generalizability is uh, when you're training a model on a certain data set, um, it should basically uh, be perform equally well uh, when you're exposing it to a data set it hasn't seen. And this scenario actually becomes very, very important in, in the case of healthcare. So imagine a health, health system that's trying to maybe you know, predict 
um, a certain type of disease risk or uh, the occurrence of a certain type of disease. And if the model that actually comes up uh, in their local data is highly accurate, how would you guarantee that that model will actually perform in cases which uh, is very different from the data it's been trained on? And the training data can be very diverse, right? So it depends on which geography is the data acquired from. It depends on what kind of setup in the hospital is that data acquired from. Uh, are these people with specific type of medical history uh, that this model has been trained on? And all of these factors uh, go into account de uh, in deciding how the model is performing in that particular data set. And if it's performing really well, you know, generally it's presumed that it will perform equally well uh, in a global setup, which is not the case, and which is why we are trying to you know, make sure that the model gets exposed to different types of data. Um, this is obviously very important to make the models more real world, uh, so that it's consistently, you know, predicting the right attributes and the right risks uh, for patient. And then when you're talking about exposing the data to multiple, uh, uh, exposing the model to multiple data sets, um, the biggest challenge for that is that these data sets are now uh, available in organizations that are local uh, to that particular organization. So it's impractical for these data sets to be centralized and be able to train on uh, in a central way. And this is equally uh, important to note. Um, there are a lot of data sharing challenges, and rightly so. Healthcare data is very, very sensitive. Uh, it cannot be shared openly. And uh, this prevents uh, organizations uh, from, you know, being able to collaborate openly on all of their individual data sets. Uh, the other problem is the standardization of healthcare data. Um, data is stored in very different formats, even though there are standards, there are customizations available for each of those standards. And it's important to note that uh, each of these customizations might be very different uh, for every organization. So to find a way in which uh, you, you find a common method in which I have a training data set that is equally standard across all of these different organizations stored in a central way is really not possible. Um, the other aspect to this is uh, ontologies. Um, you know, these are medical vocabularies that get applied on healthcare data sets to interpret them. And each of these ontologies also have different customizations built into it. So in short, I mean, even though there are standards available, there are ways in which you can centralize and maintain the data, it's really, really difficult to do. And you know, when people go out in this exercise of creating a central data repository on which they can run all their machine learning model, it just takes them forever to, to get through that hump of uh, maintaining a standard data set. That's why federated learning is a concept that's really important because it eliminates the need of uh, sharing data and, and centralizing it. Um, the decentralized approach allows you to maintain the data locally in each of these individual clients. And also the, uh, the ability to use cryptography and, and privacy preserving federated learning allows you to maintain the anonymity of the data and, and, the, and, and secure it in the right manner. And uh, of course, the advantage here is because the model gets exposed to different kinds of data sets, uh, it's more generalizable and it's uh, more applicable to more and more use cases. So now that we've got an understanding of what federated learning is, some of the privacy preserving federated learning concepts and its use in healthcare and life sciences, uh, let's talk about a use case uh, in healthcare and life sciences that we uh, will try to show you and in the process explain the setup that we chose. The use case that we are uh, going to build today is uh, about predicting the risk of mortality. And the data set that we chose was the EICU data set. This data set has about 200,000 hospital stays. Uh, it's available, uh, made available by Philips and MIT. And uh, the idea behind this data set is it's a multi-hospital data set. So each of these observations for multiple patients are captured with a hospital ID. So that makes uh, the setup uh, really intuitive because, because these data sets are in, uh, organized with each of the hospital IDs, we can pretend that each of these hospitals are individual clients in our setup that I showed you earlier. And each of these clients can have access to that hospital ID or particular hospital ID data. So that's exactly what we did in the, in the uh, creation of the model. 
And uh, of course, the model is uh, being uh, tr uh, trained as a classifier. Uh, the classification task that we are asking it to do is to learn uh, the risk of mortality. Uh, so classify whether a patient in the ICU would be um, you know, uh, going uh, out of the, or uh, being discharged out of the ICU or um, they don't make it. And in this case, uh, the whole uh, setup would be run twice. Uh, we'll have the model running locally uh, on, you know, just uh, the whole data set being in a single client. And then we'll also proceed on to show you how exactly we uh, did the setup as a federated learning, um, you know, setup on AWS. So uh, that's just a quick introduction to what uh, comes next. And uh, with that, I'd like to invite uh, Vidya uh, for the rest of the presentation. Thank you. Uh, hi everyone, my name is Vidya, Vidya Sagar Aupati and uh, I'm the Applied Science Manager in Amazon Machine Learning Solutions Lab. Uh, thanks a lot Ujwal for uh, introducing the concepts and laying down the ground for uh, providing the demo. And uh, uh, from now on what we'll talk is basically like what did uh, we as a team did uh, to evaluate the, uh, all the available open source frameworks and how did we are able to run these frameworks on AWS. So with that, um, let's get started. Okay, the primary criteria what we have primarily used um, when we are evaluating all these open source federated learning frameworks are, uh, the first one was whether it can support all the available ML frameworks like PyTorch, MXNet, TensorFlow. So if the models are built in any of these uh, ML frameworks, can they run federated, learn, federated learning environment? So that's one of the primary criteria what we have used uh, before we selected uh, a federated learning framework. Then the second most important aspect, at least in our specific use case was privacy. Can we provide privacy for federated learning either for secure aggregation or for differential privacy? Can we integrate those libraries easily? Can we uh, support uh, in the federated learning framework uh, to provide uh, these features which our customer requires? Then the third most important feature is what kind of computing configurations can it support? Can it support uh, edge devices? Can it support cross silo which is like multiple accounts? Uh, or even in a single account, can it uh, scale across multiple um, instances? So that's another primary uh, paradigm what we have used to select the federal learning framework for our evaluation. Then the other particular uh, uh, the other um, uh, criteria was primarily around the communication. Can uh, what kind of communication protocols does the federal learning framework support out of the box? Can it support gRPC, MQTT for edge devices? MPI for uh, basically uh, cross I mean cross account communications. So what kind of or how easy it, it is it to implement a new protocol to support the communication uh, whichever uh, the customers require. Then the last then the last important thing was as this is a voluntary um, uh, effort what we have been looking at we are trying to look at how well the documentation is available for us to easily run on AWS. Uh, for these open source fair federal learning frameworks. So these are the primary five uh, factors what we have considered before making a choice to run a particular federal learning framework uh, for our evaluation. Now, now, let, now let's look at the, all the frameworks what we have considered, right? The first one what we considered was the TensorFlow federal learning. Uh, as the name says, the federal, basically this is a framework offered on top of uh, uh, TensorFlow. The TensorFlow federal learning uh, primarily has two high level, two components, one is Either you can use a federated learning API. Uh, this is nothing but a high level interface, right, uh, to use the existing ML models. If you don't have any knowledge about federated learning, or, uh, but you can still use these interfaces. So you will use a built-in federated learning algorithms which are available. Or uh, if you want to implement your own algorithm, then you have to use uh, another API called federated core API, where there are lower level in interfaces which are available either to customize the existing algorithms or to bring your own algorithm. Uh, how, how does TensorFlow federated learning offer privacy, right? I mean, there is no out of the box support for, uh, for privacy in uh, TensorFlow federated learning, so, but there is an ability to integrate a library called TensorFlow privacy uh, library for providing uh, uh, privacy aspects for the federated learning. So one of the, I mean, a couple of uh, re primary reasons why we are not able to select uh, and use in our particular use case was, at this point, it, it supports only a single machine simulation. I mean, the, one of the primary things we are trying to simulate the environment uh, uh, to simulate the federated learning uh, use case, and the primary thing what it offers uh, out of the box is primarily single machine simulation. Then 
we wanted similar to even the edge devices uh, going forward and we don't we didn't see the support offer out of the box at this point and the other thing was as i highlighted earlier we want to run any model which is built on any other ml framework at this point uh, tensorflow flooded learning supports only uh, tensorflow uh, models so that's a primary reason that's another reason why we are not able to use it and there is no I mean, there is uh, no easy, uh, easy to use way of the privacy uh, mechanisms uh, uh, to support the privacy aspect as well. So these are a couple of reasons why we are not able to use TensorFlow federal learning. It doesn't mean that we cannot use, the, but, but we were primarily looking at the ease of uh, mechanisms to uh, quickly jumpstart a federal learning framework on AWS for our evaluation. Then the next federal learning framework, what we considered was primarily PySwift and PyGrid. Uh, PySwift is a federal learning framework which is offered in sub, in, inside PyGrid um, uh, software. So this is an open source uh, uh, Python library which is offered by OpenMind for federal learning and privacy preserving. Uh, the good part about the, uh, this framework was it offers all kinds of privacy aspects for differential privacy as well as encrypted computations primarily for the secure, secure aggregation. Uh, it has a very extensive support on the privacy algorithms aspect. Yeah, I, on, our, on our side, we are not able to use it primarily because at that point, we are not able to find enough uh, detailed documentation which will help us to bootstrap our evaluation pretty quickly. Then uh, let's move on uh, to the third framework, what we evaluated. We evaluated uh, the FedML framework. Uh, what does FedML framework offer out of the box? FedML framework has primarily three components in their architecture. The first one is FedML core. Uh, FedML core has primarily two, uh, two components, one is a mechanism to support your communication infrastructure with the clients and um, the peers, right? So the distributed comp computing uh, communication paradigm has been offered by FedML Core, and the other uh, the other aspect in the FedML Core was the training, uh, basically how to support different frameworks. Then the other major component was FedML API. It primarily provides you the interfaces how to train models or how to load your new datasets or customized datasets. Uh, datasets or support new FL algorithms. Then the last major aspect in the uh, FedML uh, architecture was primarily around uh, the FedML server as well as FedML client, which is primarily a way, in a, uh, a way to communicate uh, basically what is the component which has to run on a client as well as what is the component which has to run on a server primarily to aggregate the weights or to send the weights or define the messaging mechanism. So these are the three primary components in uh, FedML. Uh, but apart from these, FedML offers a lot of applications on top of it, like FedNLP, FedCV, and various alg other algorithms. And what what are the primary computing parameters? Which uh, computing paradigms? What does it offer out of the box? It offers you to weigh mechanism to test a standalone simulation, or uh, to to test a distributed computing computing environment. And the last thing was the on-device training as well. If you want to test with an on-device uh, as well with a FedML uh, environment, you should be you, you can be able to do that. Then uh, we were primarily looking, uh, as I mentioned earlier, we were primarily looking at two primary aspects. One is cross-silo, federated learning on cloud. What does it, uh, cross-silo primarily means was an ability to run clients in different accounts, different AWS accounts, and running a server on a, prior, on a third account. Uh, so that the data is not really shared. At the same time, we are uh, providing all the guarantees of a privacy preserving federated learning. And the other, other consideration, what it supports as well, was a cross-device federated learning, primarily for smartphones and IoT devices. So that is also offered out of the box uh, from uh, using FedML. What does the architecture look like? I mean, we have a, we had a pretty simplified architecture diagram over here. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, the FedML core has the communication as well as the on-device on training, uh, 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 the, the device training uh, libraries. As, a, as well as FedML API offers you a way to load your custom data sets or new FedML algorithms and a different mechanisms such as averaging, Fed average, Fed vertical, and different algorithms on the federal learning slide. And the third primary component is primarily around FedML server as well as the FedML mobile and the IoT is primarily for the clients and the server is primarily uh, the, ser the server component for the aggregation of the weights and everything. So this is a simplified architecture. If you want a detailed architecture, please visit the hyperlink which is provided uh, on the slide. So what did we do to run FedML on AWS? So this is where the, the, our team's entire effort went in. Again, 
the, the architecture, what I'm showing you is not primarily limiting ourselves to run just FedML. You can run the other, uh, uh, the other federal learning frameworks as well, unless if it supports the same communication paradigms and um, the other aspects. So as you can see, this is a high level architecture what we have built uh, primarily to support a cross silo uh, federated learning. Uh, uh, as a, I just want to highlight a couple of things. The first thing is if you want to support a cross silo environment, the first major thing what you need to do is you need to do a, you need to cross connect accounts uh, between three accounts. And the way to achieve that was you need to primarily set up a VPC peering. Uh, between these three accounts and set up a security on top of it, so so that it's a pretty uh, secure environment, which is which is currently out of offered out of the box on AWS. So you should be able to spin off uh, VPCs on the three accounts and as essentially do a VPC peering. And one other major thing what we need to do was the subnets. You need to make sure all of the devices are in the same subnet in all the account in the, all the three accounts, right? So we are showing here only with three accounts. This can be replicated for even 500 clients uh, as well, as seamlessly as possible. Uh, then the other aspect was setting up the subnets, making sure all the devices are able to communicate with each other uh, when they are able to be in the same subnet. Again, as part of my demo, I'll be showing an example of an environment which will uh, exactly simulate this. And the last part was running uh, the FedML, uh, in this particular case, FedML, FedML repo uh, inside our EC2 environment where uh, we are using gRPC for our communication and we have a couple of uh, variations of it supporting uh, MQTT and even our custom uh, communication protocols as well. That's pretty seamless. So now we just looked at the high level architecture. What does it take to run uh, FedML on AWS? What is the architecture? Now let's go and look at the details of what, uh, what does it take? Uh, what are the, all of the required steps to run uh, to build that architecture? What did, I mean, basically you can either have a single account which is having multiple instances running in it, or you can have a multi-account setup like what we did. Um, and essentially if you have a multi-account setup, you need to make sure that you're setting up your VPC pairing ahead of the time, right? So that, I mean, that, that has to be done irrespective of the FL framework what you're using. On the other, other major aspect was security is a primary key for us, so you need to primarily set up the security on top of the VPCs. And the last thing was the network configuration, which is primarily the subnets, making sure that all the subnets are properly set up. So these are the primary prerequisites which you need to set up to run any open source federal learning framework on AWS. So what are the system requirements? I just want to highlight a couple of uh, major things over here. Uh, this is primarily to highlight what did it take us to run a federal learning in a multi, in a multi uh, account scenario. But the one of the primary things which I, I want to highlight was, you can see uh, the FL, uh, the federal learning server, as, or you can call it as a model aggregator, which is running in a, uh, a central account, which is uh, the, the primary account. And you can scale out your clients running on multiple machines. They can be running on GPUs. That's the primary advantage of it. The server can be running on a normal uh, P3 uh, 2X large, uh, which is a, uh, primarily a CPU machine. Right, because the primary weight for the, the primary goal of the model aggregator was to collect the weights and uh, averaging it out of whichever fed, uh, federal learning algorithm of your choice. But in your accounts, when you're doing federal learning training, you might need a larger machine, or you might you might want to use your GPUs, right? So that's why you can see all the federal clients should can scale horizontally, uh, where you can have your uh, federal learning of training on the on-device training running on different GPUs. Uh, and models, model weights are aggreg getting aggregated at the CPU, which can communicate back to the server. So, uh, yeah, the primary thing is the, what we are trying to highlight was every client can have their own type of configuration based on the amount of data set. Uh, one account might have pretty large, I mean, it might be a, a multi-city hospital which has hundreds of uh, hospitals which they can share with their regulatory stuff, but the other hospital might be pretty small. So, so this, this offers you a flexibility of determining which compute computing configuration what you want to use in, a, in every different uh, AWS uh, account. So as I was highlighting, right, I'm basically, as I was highlighting the primary things, uh, what are the required configurations, what you guys need to do to run federated learning, right? The first thing, as I mentioned, was AWS specific configuration. What, the specific configuration, what you need to do was, you need to have a deep learning AMI with, in our case, we use a FedML GitHub repo. Um, uh, 
primarily uh, for the, to support to do the federated learning, as well as you need to be setting up the VPC pairing configuration for this multi-account scenario. Those are the primary configurations at AWS account level for any federated learning framework, right? Then, because our our, our federated learning of uh, our choice was primarily FedML, what the configuration what you need to do was what is the network configuration? What is the network configuration between the three clients that, that you had to need to set up, as well as uh, where should the models be should be running the CPU and GPU training, uh, right? Uh, basically, what is the CPU and GPU configuration? Where should the model uh, training should happen? Uh, then the last one was the custom data loader, right? Uh, where uh, basically how does the data uh, basically for your custom data how should you configure that? With that, uh, let's move on to the demo uh, what we have built uh, essentially. So as as I was uh, as I was going to show you guys uh, that uh, in the demo, uh, primarily this is what you will see. The first one was uh, where we used a way to simulate a multi, uh, like we have similar around 500 clients, uh, uh, primarily to communicate with the server in a single account. And we are primarily trying to show you that uh, one of the primary things what you need to consider was what is the evaluation criteria you needed to use for federated learning, right? Uh, as you can see here, uh, basically the, the couple of primary uh, criteria what you need to consider was the aggregation scheme, uh, right? What kind of aggregation scheme are you using? Uh, how many number of clients? Uh, number of training epochs, how many epochs should happen on every client uh, before communicating, and, and the loss function, right? And, I, I, and in this particular one, I just want to highlight the primary thing was, you should look at the performance metrics in the federal learning framework. What is the amount of data sent by the server, and what is the amount of data uh, received on the, by, from the client, as well as on the client side? So, as Ujwala uh, highlighted earlier, one of the main primary pain points was how can you primarily aggregate and provide the visualization, right? So that's what uh, we were primarily uh, demoing in the next uh, slide. And on the left, I just want to highlight something is the metrics what you see is primarily around uh, the machine learning uh, evaluation, uh, I mean machine learning metrics, which is the area under the curve uh, primarily for precision uh, and recall, as well as area under, under the curve for the, uh, basically for the ROC curve, as well as the loss, um, that's what will be. Again, this is a pretty small demo for a, de for, a uh, for a credit card data set what we have run to just validate to scale, how can we scale for, uh, for large number of clients. So, as you can see here, yeah, as, uh, basically as you can, as you can see here, uh, you can see the, in this particular scenario, the data has been being sent from the client to the server, and the server has been doing the aggregation, and uh, you can see how the, essentially the, the uh, basically the AEC, PR curve and everything has been uh, standardly incrementing over, over a period of time. So, Again, this is not the complete run. This is a pretty small run to just show when you're not using any secure aggregation, what is the performance uh, of using federated learning and what is, the, what is the performance, how does the performance metrics increment by, by about the amount of data sent and received on the server side and client side. Now let's move on to uh, the primary aspect of, okay, you can run it, we showed it on how to run it on a credit card data set. But the primary goal of this demo was to show what does it take us to evaluate and run uh, on an EAC, EAC data set. What are the customizations did our team did in FedML, apart from all other configurations, to run a new data set inside this account? Again, this repo has been taken, uh, uh, as Vujal as mentioned, uh, we started uh, last year, so most of the code base and everything is based out of last year's uh, code base. So let's get started. So as you can see here, the primary conditions what you need to do was uh, primarily around the first one was a gRPC, IPC config. So I, I just want to highlight a couple of things. As you can see here, we just simulated with two clients and one server, and we have two primary clients, uh, which is the first one is the server, and the second one, uh, one and two are the primarily the clients. And um, the, that's the first one, the, that's the first net network setup what we have to do uh, primarily to uh, run. And once you do that, the second thing, as I mentioned, was where do you want to run your model? On CPU, GPU, right? In this particular case, as you can see in the FedML gRPC, my model is running on a server as well as a clients, uh, as well as on uh, primarily on CPUs on the, all the three machines. Then that's what you have to do primarily for the network configuration. 
Then the last thing was the data loader. First thing is you need to download the data, and that's where uh, you need to create your own script to download the data, data underscore EIC. Then the, la then the other one was, once you get the data, how can you load the data, right? That's where the data preprocessing folder is, and where we where you have to create your own custom functions, how to load the partition data and everything uh, in this particular case. Yeah, one thing I want to highlight over here was, we, as Ujjal mentioned, we have taken a central data, but we made sure that we used our enough uh, feature engineering so that we partition the data such that the data doesn't leak among clients, as well as the data doesn't leak between uh, a server, be between a trained set and test data set. So we made sure all those uh, privacy preserving aspects, I mean, all those aspects are, are in, intact so that we don't have any data leakage going across. So, uh, I think uh, basically, basically you had to, I mean, you can use one of the CIFAR data set uh, examples uh, to similar to load your partition partitioning example. And uh, after that, then the other aspect, what we need to uh, primarily do was uh, your own script, right? Uh, uh, the primary thing is you had to uh, primarily uh, uh, run the train and test split. So that's what you need to do it in your, the distributed folder where you load uh, the data set uh, with the Fed average. Uh, for the distributed, right? Then the last thing was the way to run the the the, uh, the federated learning, the FedML across your client. So you need to load your data set. And these are the just the arguments what you need to pass. Then uh, moving on, uh, uh, yeah, I just want to highlight something. So this is the EAC data set what we have loaded where we have taken the the entire time series data set where we did the significant feature engineering and where we collapsed all the data set into a single patient record for all his uh, uh, vitals across uh, different time slots in a particular visit, and we were predicting uh, as a classification problem whether the user has done or not. Then the next aspect was how did we run, right? So as you can see here, we have uh, federated uh, learning running on two clients, both on the left and right, and the center uh, terminal is primarily the server, where uh, we are running two clients, and we have we have primarily selected um, uh, <coughs> uh, the number of rounds is the clients. Both the clients are running two epochs on both the sides, and primarily sending the weights for 50 rounds. So you can assume this client runs uh, two epochs and then sends an update back to the server, uh, so that the and the at this point we didn't uh, uh, we didn't consider any dropouts. So we made sure that we have a single dropout. Basically, both the clients are communicating back to the server, and the server is aggregating the weights, and that's when it will inform back to the clients so that they can restart uh, their training uh, for the second for their uh, following round. So and and the last thing I just want to highlight was. As you can see in our uh, in the in the evaluation, so we were primarily aggregating all the weights into the weights and biases portal uh, just to cross check how the training progressed. As you can see, the training um, has achieved around like 0.89 uh, uh, test accuracy uh, by the end of the training. So, <coughs> uh, with that, uh, now let's look at the benchmarking of the results of the e on the EIC data, data set, right? I mean, you have seen how to run it, so it's pretty straightforward um, with the small customizations. I, I just highlighted earlier, on the performance metric side, we consider the runtime data sent received, as well as what is the amount of uh, per round of the protocol, uh, the number of rounds for the protocol we are considering. Um, the last thing I want to highlight was we, uh, as Ujjwal mentioned, we were primarily predicting the in-hospital mortality rate and we were primarily cross-checking what will be the performance uh, for, as a classification problem, right? When we did it on a centralized training uh, learning, it was around like 0.89 and when the federal learning is 0.88 uh, when, when we use a similar data set uh, split and everything. So it's almost on par uh, so that we are able to achieve the primary goal of federal learning not penalizing any performance side. With that, uh, <coughs> With that, I mean, if you guys, uh, if anyone of you are interested in trying out federal learning on AWS or anything, please uh, reach out to one of us, either me uh, or Ujwal or um, uh, Zing Ong. Uh, she's our PM for Deep Engines. Before I conclude, <coughs> I want to say a special thanks to uh, Chow Yang, Chow Yang He and uh, Salman Awasti Mayer uh, from FedML.ai, who has been uh, pretty, who has been, who has helped us answering all the questions on FedML uh, framework, uh, either for loading your custom data sets or running uh, FedML in general. 
apart from uh, apart from that i need to i want to really thank to my team uh, primarily uh, wajahad uh, olivia and um, divya who helped us build this demo along with uh, bill hon and team who helped us uh, build uh, the infrastructure matrix and everything uh, thanks